Thank you. So I'll start with an apology. I'm full of cold, so I should be able to get through, but please um, grant me some uh, leeway if I cough a little. Having heard all that fantastic future science, I just want to start by looking back a little. So this is an illustration of the first human-to-human -human blood transfusions that were performed in the 1820s and reported by James Blundell. And this was the beginning of our transfusion services. Before this, people had tried animal-to-human transfusions. They didn't go well. So this was the first human-to-human. -human. And it's upon this that our transfusion services are built and have now become the mainstay of our clinical practice. We use them for many things. However, we have to look towards the future too. And although we're terribly well provided for in the West and in developed countries in general, there are parts of the world that don't have this luxury. So for example, there's challenges both for the developing world, but also for the developed world of transfusion transmitted infections from bloodborne disease. We've heard about Zika virus in the last few months. This is a potential virus that could enter the blood services and can be transmitted through transfusion. And this is the fight that we continually have to fight in the West or in the developed countries. But in parts of the world, malaria and HIV are endemic. Getting clean, safe blood to transfuse is no simple task. Similarly, in those parts of the world, there's a lack of infrastructure, such that if you go into hospital and you need surgery, you may have to take your friends and family with you so they can donate the blood that you may need to use. Perhaps the bigger challenge globally is the fact that the population as a whole is aging. It's doing so all around the world, in some parts of the world more acutely than in others. And over the next 20 to 50 years, we're going to have a massive increase in those members of the population who are over 60 years old. And with that will be the associated rise in healthcare. So they'll have more surgery, they'll have more cancers, they'll have more chronic diseases that, main, that need blood to maintain and to treat them. So that means that the increased um, need is going to go up dramatically, but at the same time, there's proportionately fewer young, healthy donors. So we need to find ways that we can provide blood for the future. And it's this that the blood services are now starting to consider and to move towards what we do next. So if we're going to think about how we make things better, we have to think about what we currently do. And I'd pose this question to you. So this is a unit of blood, a blood transfusion that we all think of. But what's actually in that bag? When we donate it, it's whole blood, comes straight out of your arm and then goes, it's processed, and it comes back out into the hospitals. So is the whole blood still in there? The red cells, the white cells, and the plasma? Is it just the red cells, just the oxygen-carrying stuff? Or is it the red cells and the white infection-fighting cells? Fortunately for me, if we're going to try and replace this, it's just the red cells. So when we talk about a blood transfusion, we should really be talking about a red cell transfusion. However, it's not quite that um, favorable. So when we think about how many cells are in there, you heard earlier on how many cells are in a human body. The vast majority of them are actually red blood cells. So when we take the majority of them are actually red blood cells back into a patient, 450 milliliters, are there millions of cells, billions of cells? or even trillions, and this is what we're going to have to make to replace it. Unfortunately, it's the highest option. There's 2 million million red cells in each and every transfusable unit. We use 2.2 million units a year in the UK alone. The global average is about 80 million per year. So now if you start multiplying that 2 million in Britain by 2 trillion in each unit, we're into the 10 to the 18s for annual um, need in the UK alone. So we've got a lot of cells to make. <laughs> so why did we set out on this particularly challenging project? And we heard about DARPA earlier on as well. It's an American defense organization who have these DARPA hard challenges. And they're meant to invoke transformational change in the hope that along the way, good things will come. We replied to a call in 2007. And what they wanted was actually something very specific, very specific indeed. They wanted a machine that could be dropped out of a helicopter into the field of battle and would produce blood in the battlefield. They were incredibly specific about the size, two and a half washing machine size it worked out at, and that you would drop it in. And they wanted it from a renewable stem cell source. Although at the time this was an American funding body, you weren't allowed to use embryonic stem cells. So even that was difficult. Not only that, they wanted it within 27 months of starting. Easy. Have you heard about this yet? No. Um, so <laughs> we put together a team to try and address this, and it was formed from the Irish Blood Service, the English Blood Service, and the Scottish Blood Service, which sounds like the beginning of a very bad joke. <laughs> and when I look at how we've aged since those photographs, I think it probably is some kind of bad joke. Um, anyway, we put the team together to look at the biology, the engineering, all of the whole thing we'd require to produce that machine. 
We reckoned it would cost about $50 million to do that 27 months worth of work. That's what we told DARPA. They said, no, thank you, <laughs> unsurprisingly, perhaps. But on the back of that, we then realized that this was a thing that we would want to do. And we kind of rationalized our intent a little. And we realized that rather than trying to do this for military use and in a fancy machine, perhaps if we looked at the basic biology and started to understand how this process might be possible, we could use it for normal blood transfusion use. At that point, fortunately, we went to the Wellcome Trust, who very generously funded us and continued to do so. So how do we start to make these red blood cells? How do we do this in the lab? And the obvious answer is we do it from stem cells. We heard beautifully earlier on from Professor Madrigal about the hematopoietic or blood stem cell, and that's how we make red cells in our body. So we should take stem cells too, right? The problem is if we take the adult stem cells, so those stem cells that are in our bone marrow and do this job for us every day, they're there to maintain and to um, keep our organs healthy and fit. However, once you take them out of their natural environment, they lose the capacity to keep growing. So we're limited in the amount of it to keep growing. And therefore, the number of cells we'll be able to get. Remember, numbers is our, main, our number one challenge. So we looked to other stem cell types. Unfortunately, human embryonic stem cells have been published and discovered in 1998. Now, these are cells that come from a really early stage human embryo. Because they were going to make the embryo, they have the capacity to make all cells of the human body. So they're called pluripotent. They will grow and they'll proliferate, as far as we know, indefinitely in the lab, as long as you look after them properly, and we can turn them into whatever we want them to be, including our red blood cells. So this is one great source. The problem is they come from human embryos, and there are many parts of the world and many people who have an issue with that. So there's ethical concerns with these cells. Fortunately, in 2007, on human tissue, Shinji Yamanaka in Japan came up with this fantastic idea. So he was able to take, at that point, skin, but now cells from many parts of the body. And by introducing just four genetic factors, convert those skin cells into a population of cells that are, in, to all intent and purpose, the same as those pluripotent stem cells from an embryo. So they'll continue to grow indefinitely, and they can form any tissue of the body. And he called these induced pluripotent stem cells. This is absolutely paradigm shifting. So this means now that we can take tissue from any body we can make a stem cell line from it, and we can turn it into any tissue that you would want. For us, it's really important because now we get to choose the blood group of our donor. So we can choose who we take the skin biopsy from, for example. As long as they consent, we make a stem cell line. We can differentiate that into the red cells we need or any other tissue. So we've decided to concentrate primarily on the pluripotent cells, although we still look at adult cells as the ideal paradigm. Now, if there's one message that I would really like for you to take home today, it's that this is not fake, it's not artificial, it's not synthetic. We're doing our damnedest to make the same cells in the lab that your body makes. Now, your body's phenomenally good at this. We make two million red blood cells every second. Every second of every day, we're all making two million new red cells. That's the kind of competition we have. However, <laughs> we're trying to do an as-nature product, if you like. It's not synthetic, it's not fake or artificial. We call it cultured red blood cells. Now, this is purely because we grow them in culture. We've looked at lots of other names. Nothing really seems to work. If anybody has any idea what we should call this, I'd be very grateful to hear them, because we're a little stuck. Cultured, to me, implies they go to the opera and they like singing. <laughs> but we don't know what else, so I'll take suggestions if you would like. Um, I've deliberately left the detail in this picture just to show you how complex it is. As I said, our body's very good at this. We need to be just as good. And we have to undertake the same process. So we start with the pluripotent stem cells on the far side here. We have to differentiate them all along the way to red blood cells. We have to do that first by telling them only to make blood. They can make muscle, they can make bone, they can make neurons, they can make liver, they can make whatever we want. We don't want them to do that. We only want red cells. So we have to try and limit their options. When we decided only to make blood, we have to tell them only to make white cells, not, uh, sorry, only red cells, not the white cells. And then we have to differentiate them for fully to the end. All of these different points are different interventions. And what we do is to change the media they grow in. So we change the signals they're receiving to try and influence them along the right path and not along the path that we don't want them to take. This is done by giving them protein-based growth factors that give that signal to the cell. So we start off with the pluripotent stem cells. You can see them there. Each little dot is a stem cell that has the capacity to turn into anything. 
And after about 30 to 31 days, we end up with the red cells. Now, it's pretty fortunate that they hemoglobinize, so we can see along the way how well we're doing because they go red, so we know we're on the right track. And we end up with pellets of red cells like these. In 2008, when we first in the first funding, we could make about 100,000 cells. That photograph came off a summer student's phone on a Sunday afternoon, and we keep it even though it's a bit crappy because it was the first one we had. By the end of our first Wellcome Trust funding, <clears throat> we were able to make 10 billion, or 1 times 10 to the 10 cells, a five log increment from the same number of starting cells. So this was a really big advance over that time. However, getting that 10 to the 10 cells took an awful lot of effort. So these are flasks that were grown in the tissue culture lab. There's 88 of them. And those 88 flasks contain a total of 8.8 .8 litres of medium, which is both very time consuming very handling heavy, and also very expensive. So what we're now looking at doing is to move this towards a more industrialised process of moving into bioreactors. So the bioreactor at the top there is a 10-litre tank, a single-use tank. It's a plastic bag inside the reactor, essentially. There's a stirrer in there that keeps the cells moving. We change the gas mixes, we change the media that goes in, and we can control pH, for example. The key thing with this is the 10 litres will give us enough to make one unit of blood. But because the technology is established, we can scale up to the same range of, of uh, units, which go up to 2,000 litres. And then we can scale out by having multiples of that. So this technology should see us through to some of the numbers that we need. So then we need to start thinking about what type of blood we're going to make. And like I said, with the induced pluripotent stem cells, we can choose what blood group we make. The obvious thing is to use the OERESIS-D universal donor blood. So, I live in Glasgow on a Saturday night after an old firm game. It's a particularly stabby city. So if you go into uh, A&E on a Saturday night, a rhesus negative is what you would get given. It's what we're all familiar with. We can safely treat 98% of the population with this. So this would be a really high volume, potentially low cost distribution model. The other option is there are people model groups and at the moment they find it very difficult to get transfusions. Rhesus null people for example is about 500 in the world. Now, that's fine as long as they're fit and healthy but imagine now they have a chronic disease that needs transfusion support. The options are not there for those patients. So we could curate a bank of stem cell lines with those very rare blood groups and we could use those as a more on-demand niche product. Completely different model, very low volume, very high cost relatively but for patients with no other option. One of the key things here is that once we've made the cells, everything fits into the current blood systems. So we just get the cells from somewhere different. They go in the same bags. They can even go in the same um, transport solution, we believe. And then they get dis distributed in the same way as blood does now. So that back end for the delivery is already there. It's already built and established. We've set up a group to look at this, and the, the project group is called Novosang. It was called Blood Pharma originally. We did some public um, questions, and they didn't like the fact it had pharma in the title. They distrusted that immensely. So we've chosen Novosang as an alternative. It's not a company. It's just our project name. So we're starting with our single unit in our bioreactor there. To get to phase one, phase two trials, we're looking at 10 to the 15 cells. That's the current limit of cell production for protein therapeutics or antibody production for example. So we're really pushing the limits of cell production. UK annual, who knows, maybe Grange Mouth will be available to us. Um, but it's not just the biology, so it's not just how we make the cells, it's all the allied technologies and tools that go along with it. As I said, we need to look at the bioprocessing and the biomanufacturing at the same time. We need to intensify the cultures above what's normally done. When people currently grow cells, it's to make antibodies, it's to make proteins. The purpose there is to work the cell as hard as possible and then kill it to harvest the protein. They don't care about the cell itself, they just want the yield. We have completely the opposite issue. We're trying to keep our cells as happy and as intact as possible. It's a completely different way of thinking. So all of the established volume reduction and separation technologies used in pharma at the moment are not applicable to this model of regenerative medicine and cellular therapies. So we need to look again at all of those. Cost is going to be massive. If I was to run that 10 litre bioreactor tomorrow, it would cost £30,000 to get a unit of blood as a low estimate. So obviously we've got a lot to do for that. And the time as well, 30 days is a long time. So we're looking at reducing the timeline and the cost. We need new QC and new QA for these. 
And importantly, the clinical trials and the regulatory systems have to be brought along too. But a lot of that learning is transferable to other therapies. And one of the reasons that this is a great project for us, within the blood service, we don't just deliver blood. We deliver tissues and other cellular therapies too. So we can transfer all of that learning into those other therapies for heart cells, for liver cells, for vascular cells, for example. So a really quick just look at the partners. So this is not individuals, this is just institutions who are involved in NovoSang. You can see this is a fairly UK-wide, Scotland-biased, but UK-wide uh, initiative. And we've been fortunate to get a lot of funding for the moment. So I think what we're doing now is moving towards this era of regenerative medicine underpinned by cellular therapies. We've heard about some of them already. Professor Madrigal this morning spoke about bone marrow transplant. It's the original cellular therapy. We've been doing it for 50 years and people forget. They think cell therapy is new and trendy. It's actually very established. Similarly, red cell transfusion is a cell therapy. So now we're looking at treating other organs. And instead of limiting the symptoms with a drug, you would actually treat with cells to replace what's been lost or destroyed. And in that way, you could effect a cure. So taking the absolute paradigm, if you have type 1 diabetes, you get insulin every day. Why don't you replace the islet cells, replace the beta cells? Then the body will be able to produce its own insulin, and you won't need to have that daily injection. Similarly with liver disease, if you've got a liver that's gone past the point of self-repair, if you could put back in liver cells, you could potentially support that person. So we're looking at all of these alternatives. And I truly believe that this is where medicine is going to go in the future. And that rather than treating with drugs, we're going to be giving back the cells, the organs, and the tissues that we need to replace them. For the people, the younger amongst us in the audience, in 50 years' time, this should be the normal way of treating many diseases. Thank you.